When we consume entertainment media like video games, we typically try to escape our stressful reality, catch a break from the hardships of life, or simply have fun. But as many of us learn at some point, some games are not fun or rewarding in the traditional sense. Some games are interesting. A few years ago I stumbled across a YouTube video about the dystopian point-and-click strategy game Beholder. The video was a paid advertisement, however the creators always emphasized that their opinions shall never be clouded by promotional contracts. So I listened on, as they described the game with a cool premise, a dark, original art style, gameplay that allows for emotionally impactful choices with real legitimate consequences. How could I possibly refuse to try this myself? It was decided. As soon as the next Steam sale came around, I bought Beholder, and then I played it. You see, the creators of that video had not deceived me. All of the things mentioned above are definitely in the game, but when I was in the receiving end of these features, I didn't have a lot of fun. In fact, I felt more stressed out and quite frankly frustrated with this game. After a handful of fruitless attempts, I looked up some guides, pushed through and eventually finished Beholder. I didn't feel much better about it though, even asking myself if my time had ultimately been wasted as I could have just done something more enjoyable. But why does this happen? In early 2023, a YouTuber named Zoldim uploads a video titled Fear and Hunger, an in-depth look at the RPG that hates you. What followed was one of the fastest and most explosive growth spurts of any indie game I have ever seen. Videos started popping up, accumulating millions of views in a matter of weeks, the fanbase grew exponentially, every creator and their grandmother suddenly felt the urge to hop on the hype train and make a video about it. Me included. I clicked on Zoldim's video. Not because of the title, even though it is well written, I clicked on it because the art style of the characters in the thumbnail looked so... weird. It wasn't what I'd call smooth, like many other games, it wasn't pixel art, it was not ugly for the sake of shock value, it was unique. Surely enough, the third or fourth time the video got recommended to me, I finally caved in and gave it a watch. He went on to describe a game that sounds extremely unpleasant, but somehow all the more captivating because of it. Limited save points, enemies with coin flip instant kill attacks, ridiculous traps that mean certain death in most situations, losing you hours of progress. Why would anyone want to play this? Well, to quote Zoldum, Are the fear and hunger games good? I don't know, but I don't like good games, I like interesting games. That statement stuck with me for months, and ultimately led me to the question, what makes games interesting in that sense, and why do they seem so appealing? When I saw Limbo on the Steam store, I saw a game that looked special. We follow a young boy, innocent and voiceless, on a journey through a strange place void of any natural light and filled with terrifyingly dangerous constructions. Limbo ticks off a lot of boxes on the interesting list. It has a mysterious aesthetic, but familiar gameplay. No complicated story with tons of characters you need to remember or wacky world building to throw you off, but an ending that leaves room for lots of interpretation and ignites strong discourse between its players, potentially addressing heavy, for some even traumatizing topics. I had a lot of anticipation for Limbo, but as is often the case, it didn't live up to the hype I had wrongfully built in my mind. We all know this phenomenon. You see or hear about a game, a movie, a book, and you put it on a list. This process alone produces an unexpected rush of dopamine, urging you to fantasize about consuming this incredible piece of media, and in turn, it consuming you. But it usually doesn't go that way, does it? Typically, it stops at imagining, but on the odd chance where you actually follow through and watch that show or play that game, it's often not as great as you had anticipated, is it? We all have that pile of shame, that steadily growing backlog of promises unfulfilled. This is certainly not exclusive to interesting games, but is a relevant point to consider because games can appear magnitudes more interesting than most of them could ever hope of actually being. It's only a shame when the game's interesting components are actually there but held back by one or multiple flaws too great to overlook. With Limbo specifically, it's the gameplay. 
Limbo is a side-scrolling platformer. Not a challenging one like Celeste or the classic Rayman for the PlayStation 1, but a platformer nonetheless. To my disappointment, Limbo commits the cardinal sin of this genre, having unresponsive controls and thus very clunky movement. Yes, the protagonist is a child, yes, this might even be an intentional choice to emphasize the dangerous journey of the character, but for me personally, this design choice falls flat on its face. The lackluster gameplay forces you to repeat a lot of Limbo's sections and puzzles, most of which are sadly not interesting enough to warrant repeated visiting. During my playthrough, I noticed how increasingly tedious and decreasingly immersive the game had become, even during its strikingly short playtime, and I can't help but feel genuinely sad about the game's incredible atmosphere and impressively well thought out concept feeling so much less impactful because of it. I know that expecting all of these aspects to be perfectly harmonious is asking a lot. But I also feel like Limbo lost a lot of its potential due to faulty game design. Potential which could have otherwise been easily tapped, and worst of all is, it doesn't feel like Limbo wants me to feel the frustrations of a young boy's clumsiness. It never meant to annoy me. What about games that actually do? After playing both Fear and Hunger games, as well as engaging with its community for a while, I've noticed that a good portion of the fanbase seems to have never played the games themselves. This is certainly in part due to the grotesque visuals they contain, and I also contemplated playing them for that reason, but I don't think this is the whole story. I believe that some aspects of these games are fun on paper, or rather, seem incredibly exciting when presented and broken down to you in an easily digestible way, like a video essay. Learning about the world of fear and hunger is fun and engaging when you watch Warm Girl's lore breakdowns, and when she mentions how most of that information is hidden behind dialogue from very specific interactions or books that can drop randomly in some places, it sounds cool and unique. However, you did not grind out all of these books that prevent more useful items from dropping into place. You did not have to waste your turns in combat talking to horrific creatures who would most often not only barely answer, but likely chop off one of your limbs as punishment. You can watch someone else do it and tell you how terrible yet exciting it was. Unlike with Limbo, this is not about a message or a point falling short because the gameplay is too punishing, too tedious, too hard. In Fear and Hunger, suffering is the point. Dying unpredictably to RNG and all the anger that comes with it is exactly what these games, their world and the characters' stories are about. Avoiding or fixing the suffering takes away from what actually makes the games unique and, well, interesting. Naturally, you are allowed to enjoy these games in any way you want, but if the point is to experience the world through struggle and hardship, and you omit this part entirely, Something is surely lost in translation, if you will. The underlying question in my mind is, what is the correct approach for interesting titles? Can I experience them the intended way while also having fun? Getting over it with Bennett Foddy is an interesting title. The game is short, but intentionally cruel and punishing. The commentary during gameplay is deliberately included in order to mock you for every mistake and annoy you as much as possible. Don't worry, I'll save your progress, always, even your mistakes. This game found wide appeal through live streaming, as viewers love to see big creators fail and become frustrated. This is certainly what the creator had anticipated. He even talks directly to the viewer of the stream of video, mocking them for their supposed inability to play a video game themselves, expecting someone else on the internet to do it for them. Now I know, most likely you're watching this on YouTube or Twitch, while some dude with 10 million views does it for you. Like a baby bird being fed chewed up food. That's culture too. This sort of ties into the previous point, but what I'm actually interested in is the experience of playing this game. Which I did. Quite a few hours, in fact, before ultimately deciding that I had enough. That's when I noticed something. To me, it seems like getting over it is first and foremost intended to be frustrating. You're not supposed to have fun. Are you stressed? I guess you don't hate it if you got this far. Feeling frustrated? It's underrated. There are few titles as transparent and upfront about such intentions, but this is one of them. 
Unlike with Fear and Hunger, there is no thematic concept which would warrant janky controls, a lack of progress saving and the ridiculous difficulty curve. The concept here is to piss off the player and mock the lazy people watching them. You can't immerse yourself into the game, you can't empathize with the character you're playing, because the one suffering is actually you. It's always been you, and you alone. Even though I kind of knew this going in, I still decided to stick around for a while. Maybe I thought myself capable enough to beat the game more quickly than my peers. Maybe I believed my immense willpower to protect me from unnecessary frustration and anger. Perhaps I was wrong on all accounts. I knew I wasn't supposed to have fun, but I tried to anyway. Can you blame me? In the end, I paid the price for my foolish assumptions. However, I recognized I would not be able to finish the game in any way that would feel satisfying or interesting enough to me. So I quit. And honestly, I don't think I've missed out on anything that getting over it has to offer. I've climbed a good part of the path, fallen dozens of times, listened to equally as many lines of sassy poetry by Mr. Foddy himself. Trying to finish this game would not enhance my experience any further, and I think it's important to recognize that point. Sometimes, less is more. After playing Fear and Hunger myself, I'm kind of glad I did. It was frustrating, it was tedious, it was scary, it was also fun. Now that I've experienced some of the game's unique aspects firsthand, I can relate a lot more with other people talking about them. Even though I have not seen the majority of character interactions and have only earned one of the many endings myself, I do understand now. At least some things. But things I didn't understand just from listening to other YouTubers. They can tell you how scary the dogs at the beginning of the game are for hours on end when you actually boot up the game yourself, sitting in your comfortable, quiet home, and the dogs suddenly start barking at an unbelievably high volume, you will absolutely panic. No video can give you this feeling, and for that reason alone, I think my time was not wasted after all. Will I play it again? Maybe, but probably not. I played it mainly to experience the music for my OST review, and if no specific reason comes up, I don't see myself entering these dungeons again. But I think that's good. Perhaps my first round of Fear and Hunger should remain my last one. Perhaps less can be more after all. Back when I played Beholder, I hadn't been as wise. Beholder is set in a 1984-ish totalitarian regime, and the game also imposes a certain amount of frustration on the player, however, it is for an entirely different reason. The situation you're immersing yourself in is an absolute nightmare. You're playing as Carl, a government-installed landlord tasked with spying on his tenants and reporting potential crimes, and throughout the game, you're challenged with impossibly difficult decisions. Do you report friendly citizens who helped you obtain illegal medicine for your sick daughter just because they don't follow the ridiculous rules the government made up literally yesterday? What if they are innocent, but your superiors want you to plant an illegal item in the home to get rid of them? What if they threaten to send your son to the coal mines for the rest of his life if you don't follow their orders? You might recall the start of this video, and that I did not enjoy my time in Beholder all that much. After completing my first run, barely understanding what's going on and getting one of the bad endings, I wasn't satisfied. Immediately I jumped back in, hoping to find the satisfaction I was used to from more conventional titles. To my disdain, the more I played it, the less I felt like I want to. But unlike with Limbo or getting over it, I think this was in great part my own fault. Beholder is not supposed to be comfortable. You're not supposed to know how to cheat the system and make the most efficient decisions, at least not on your first run. And yes, designing a game around such a negative premise is difficult. There needs to be proper balance between frustrating elements and player agency, and whether Beholder and its sequels strike that balance decently is up for debate. But had I approached Beholder with all of this in mind, had I not tried to always find the perfect solution for each encounter, restarting the game every couple of in-game days just to get bamboozled again shortly after, had I just accepted that Beholder is not about min-maxing a desperate situation, but rather about experiencing the emotional weight of decisions I hope none of us will ever have to make in real life, maybe I wouldn't have played it in the first place. 
but maybe I would, and maybe I would have enjoyed it in an entirely different, not traditionally fun, but somehow still exciting way. Books and movies on heavy topics can be intriguing, engaging, and satisfying to consume. They can teach us valuable lessons, offer new perspectives, allow us to empathize with personalities we'd never have the chance to meet in real life. Why not video games? To end this on a positive note, I want to shortly tell you about Antichamber, an indie puzzle game that shares some similarities with other FPS puzzle games like Portal, but ultimately has a completely different concept. Antichamber expects you to think truly outside of the box and occasionally throw conventional logic out the window. When I played it the first time, I quit after a couple of hours. I simply couldn't figure out how to make progress. I felt frustrated, disappointed, on the verge of writing a negative review. But then I tried again and told myself to give it a fair shot. Play the game the way it is, not the way you expect it to be, I told myself. And about 20 hours later, I completed what is probably one of my all-time favorite video games, period. Antichamber had convinced me to accept its unorthodox rules, looking ways I never looked before, finding things in places they never should have been at to begin with. Without overplaying its impact, I can genuinely say that this game taught me a thing or two. Not about how to play video games, but how to think and possibly act in all areas of life. When I imagine having missed out on this experience due to an initial misunderstanding, it saddens me to think about what else I might have missed out on in a similar manner. But I'm also glad, knowing that I did enjoy Antichamber with all it has to offer, and that I can share this experience with you. If there is anything you take away from this video, let it be the following. If you plan on playing interesting titles, give them a fair chance and try to understand what they have to offer. Don't expect them to be something they're not, because they never will. Accept them for what they are, and if they turn out to be something you're not interested in, don't feel ashamed to walk away. You'll find something worth your time. Something that is interesting to you. And you should probably go and play Antichamber. Seriously, it's brilliant. Dear people, I hope you had fun listening to my thoughts on what I affectionately dubbed interesting video games. Have you made similar experiences yourself? Do you play games like these, or do you just stick to video essays featuring them? Make sure to share your thoughts in the comments, I'm very eager to hear them. If you had a good time, remember to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. Normally we talk about music and soundtracks on here, which will also continue, but I like to sprinkle in other topics occasionally. You know, to keep things interesting. Tell me what you think about this video and if you have suggestions for similar topics, let me know. Thank you for watching, I'll see you in the next one. Take care.